go, folks. Amen. Thank you very much. I'm good. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk about God's fingerprints on the AD 1611. And we're going to go over nine things. There's probably 20 I could go over, but these are going to be some of the heavy hitters. And these are things that just, if you want to, I call them on the radical right fringe of biblical Christianity. We take them for granted in uh, our circles, Bible even circles. These things that I'm going to talk about. Some of you already heard from some of these already, even taught on some of these already. We take it for granted. But you just think, let's just start back, way back here on this board. Remember when Moses comes off the mountains with the Ten Commandments? And then we go 1,500. With the 15 commandments, right? We lost five. We lost, one there. lost five. I got a feeling I'm going to be in trouble over that. After you're gone tonight, I think. Anyway, but anyway, so you start 1500, uh, 1500 BC, BC with Moses. Then you go all the way to uh, the time of Christ, and then 100 years, approximately 90 AD, you have John writing the book of Revelation. And then you go all the way to 1611. So think about that, the process, how it starts. It starts from some stone tablets. And the Word of God is trampled, not trampled, but uh, you're in the desert, the Sinai, and you're walking around there in a box. Okay? And then you get it in the first century, and you have a bunch of fragments, and people are exchanging them, making copies. <laughs> Whoever's got a copy of my notes, just raise your hands just for a second. Copy of notes. Raise the, raise the paper. Raise the paper. How long do you think that piece of paper is really going to last if you were to use it every day? Every would it last 100 years, would it? Wouldn't last 100 years. Okay? So, yeah, spaghetti, right? Coffee, donuts, you know, whatever. Dunkin' Donuts. Hey, by the way, Dunkin' Donuts. We haven't, we haven't been there yet. <laughs> we got to at least get a picture in front of Dunkin' Donuts for our associate pastor down in Pensacola. I got to get just stand there in front of it. I don't have to eat a donut. I just can stand in front of one, right? Anyway, that's that's another story. So you got to understand this, how miraculous some of this stuff is. You start with a not not just a blank piece of paper, but no piece of paper at all. And you start coming up with some of this stuff. Alright? So, it's a supernatural book. Of course, God doesn't do anything easy if he doesn't. Right? So this is the case. And he takes his time. Right? Very, you're not patient, but he is. So let's go. Let's talk a little bit. Let's just start with the first one. Okay? The AD 1611 is made up of 66 books. 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. And that doesn't match the Roman Catholic Bible. It doesn't match the Anglican Bible. According to the New York Times, it thinks the, the Epistle of Thomas should be there and the Epistle of Judas should be there. It doesn't match them. 1611 has 39 books in the old, 27 in the new. How do we know that we have the right number? Well, one could say, well, there's 39 books in the uh, Orthodox a Jewish Old Testament, you know, you could say that. But what about those 27? You have 39 and 27. That's kind of a weird break, isn't it? 39 and 27. Well, the reason why you know that you have the right number of books, 66, is Isaiah. It was written about 400 years before the birth of Christ, 4,500 years before the book of Christ. Now go to the book of Isaiah. Now remember, we start with a blank piece of paper, but God, God in his knowledge of how many books he's going to have in his Bible, he makes, he puts Isaiah together and, he, and mysteriously puts 66 chapters in it. All right? Look at the book of Isaiah. How many chapters does it have in it? 66. All right? You know, it's just a quink and dinky. How many chapters is of uh, Job? Anybody know? No, look at the book of Job. How many? Job is a type of the Jew in the tribulation, 42. How long is the great tribulation going to last? 42 months. Isn't that kind of weird? But let's go back to Isaiah. Because we want to be, we really want to be confident in how many books we have in the Old Testament. Now I could go to the tabernacle 
Now we could go to the, the showbread table. And on the showbread table in the tabernacle, they had bread. Bread, like Jesus says, uh, uh, that he, you know, he, he's likened to bread, right? Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Okay? And uh, the Word of God, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So you see the correlation there. Well, I could go into the tabernacle, and I could see six loaves of bread. On one side of the table, if I had a table like this, I would see six loaves of bread here and six loaves of bread here. Kind of a quinky dinky, right? Like 66? Be one way you could look at it, just kind of quinky dinky, right? But let's look at this book of Isaiah. Isaiah is very interesting in that. It's significant because its authorship has been a subject of controversy for some time. The reason for this is that there's a noticeable shift in the, shift in the tone of the book starting in chapter 40. And I didn't bring my book uh, that, that talks about that, but they call it, uh, it's called Deutero-Isaiah. The scholars, rather than looking at a reason why God would make a shift in Isaiah 40, rather than do that, they say, well, it's pretty obvious to us that there was two people that wrote the book of Isaiah. One for the first 39 books, and one for the last 27 books. That's what the scholars say. But didn't we say the Old Testament has 39 books in it? And the New Testament has 27 books in it? Isn't there a significant change in tone between the first 39 and the second, 20, and the second half of the 27? So even the scholars, there's a break between chapter 39 and chapter 40. But there's even more to that. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. Well, I've got it up here so you don't have to, but I'm just saying rhetorical. Look, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. That's in Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 40, where the break happens. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Kind of interesting, huh? You've heard this before, haven't you? Isaiah 66, verse 22. The last chapter in Isaiah. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Alright, Isaiah 1, 2. Isaiah chapter 1. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. You don't have to look there. I mean, look up here. Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Isaiah chapter 1, I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. So God's trying to show In fact, there are some brothers that have looked at each chapter of Isaiah and saw a correlation between each book of the Bible. But I'm just showing you Isaiah chapter 1. I, Isaiah chapter 40 would match Matthew. Who shows up in Matthew? The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Matthew 3.3. 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The 40th book of the Bible matches the 40th chapter of Isaiah. You can find in the context. Alright? Well, what about the book of Revelation. You were just going to ask that. <laughs> she was just going to ask that. <laughs> Revelation 21 1. Because you knew where I was headed, right? Is there a correlation in Revelation? You know there is. It has to be. And I saw a new earth. Same thing it says in Isaiah 66. Or as the new heavens and new earth. Remember, we started with no books of the Bible. We started with an empty slate. And the Lord knew from Isaiah, and he knew from the tabernacle, you're going to have to have 66 books in your Bible. So you have the right number of books. So the Roman Catholic Bible is wrong, Newsweek is wrong, and
and so uh, is the Anglican Church. Yeah, the right. Now, what about the order of the books? The order of the books in the KV 1611 does not match, in the Old Testament, does not match the Hebrew Orthodox scriptures. Now, that's a shame, isn't it? Shouldn't it be a one to one correlation? Shouldn't, if we were really sticking with the stuff, shouldn't we in our Old Testament, shouldn't the order of our books match the Hebrew Old Testament? One would think. But they don't. Now, lest you think the King James translators are so far off track, uh, can you name me a modern English translation in the last hundred years that follows the Orthodox Jewish scriptures order of their books? Which or which which what do the English, the modern, so-called modern English versions, which order of the books do they follow? They follow the Hebrew of the synagogue, or they follow the order of an AD 1611. Which do they follow? 1611. Why? Because this is the real. In order to counterfeit, they got to follow the order of these books. You say, well, why is that? Well, it's set up for a reason. In 2 Chronicles 36, that would be the last, Bible, last book of the Bible for an Orthodox Jew, it tells that Jew to go back and build the temple. Are you supposed to go back and build the temple? No. no. Not you. You're not interested in building the temple. You'll probably be out of here before the temple's either uh, completed or even started in construction. Mm -hmm. In 2 Chronicles 36, 23, Cyrus tells those Jews to go back and build the temple. Things that happen in the Old Testament, you can guarantee they're going to happen again in the future. That's just, it happens, it's just like a, if it happened in the Old Testament, it'll happen again, happen again. Okay. So the Jews told to go back and build that temple. The Jew right now in the United States of America is supposed to go back to Israel and is supposed to be trying to build a temple. That's what the Jew in this country is supposed to be doing and around the world. They're being told, you've got to go back. Yeah. Turn to your uh, Bible in uh, Malachi. Go to Malachi. The last book of your Bible in the Old Testament is Malachi. Look at verse 6. Malachi 4 6. Your Old Testament says, And he shall turn the head. The heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest they come and smite the earth with a curse. Mm -hmm. Now there's no way that the AV translators could know to put the order of the books the way we've got it. But here's an interesting thing. The Old Testament, is that a blessing or is that a curse? It's a curse because you can't keep the law. No one's ever been able to keep the law. Mm -hmm. For as many as are the works are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's why you need a New Testament. The Lord didn't want to end on a sour note. So he had to write another 27 books. Okay. Now, this is not the only peculiar thing about the order of the books compared to the traditional Hebrew text. Now you have your notes there. You should be able to see in your notes this graph here. This originally was written by uh, Brother Rick Hall when I was at Charity Baptist Church. He put this together. All right. Now you have to study this later. I'm going to maybe blast through it a little too fast for you. But these books in the Old Testament and the New Testament are put in what they call premillennial order. In other words, you have a church age, you have the, the Old Testament, the Jewish time, you have the Jewish time, let's say, you have the Old Testament, then you have the New Testament, then you have the rapture, then you have a tribulation, then the Lord, come, Lord Jesus Christ comes back in the second advent, and he sets up his kingdom. That's called premillennium. In other words, the millennium, the thousand year rule and reign of Christ, the good times, doesn't happen until Jesus Christ comes back. So, in history, 
The Bible's already set in stone. This is what was going to happen. You have a time of, if you want to call the Gentiles, for 2,500 years. Then he God picks out of people for himself, the, the Jews. They reject the Messiah. So we have the church age that's been running now for close to 2000, a little over 2,000 years. Soon there'll be the rapture. Then you'll have a tribulation, run seven years. Then the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back, um, rescue Israel, like the Calvary, you know, the dun, 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 the Calvary comes over the hill. Jesus Christ with the saints, the host, Amen. come back. We're the Calvary. We rescue Israel. We enter in the Millennium Kingdom, and then we go into eternity. See? Now, the Puritans were all millennial. They thought they were bringing in the kingdom. So there's no way that they figured this out. This had to be the Holy Spirit working through them to put the books in the order that they are. Remember I said they had the Apocrypha. Originally in the first 1611 edition, they had the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha books are Old Testament books that don't belong there. They're not in the traditional Hebrew Orthodox text. It's a fabrication by the Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. In the 1613 edition, those Apocrypha books are gone. Mm -hmm. All right, so anybody wants to ask me about the Apocrypha books, that's like the, uh, what is the, I can't remember one of them right now because I don't read them. Right. Maccabees, right. Maccabees, Bell Bell Ecclesiasticus Dragon. or something, yep. I don't Bell know. The Dragon. Tobit and uh, Bell the Dragon. Bella Dragon and uh, <laughs> Godzilla meets uh, <laughs> Hong, uh, King Kong and uh, Cladon. You know, make up a name. That's just, that's what's worth. That's what the apocrypha is worth. Okay. Anyone come up with a word called apocrypha isn't worth a dime anyway. <laughs> you already know it's not worth anything. Apocrypha. You gonna spend fifty dollars on an apocrypha, brother? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. What do you do? Change your tire with it? I, I don't know. Okay. So we don't want apocrypha. All right. So. We know we're supposed to have 66 books, but the order of the books, it's supernatural. But God knew history, and he knew it would be supernaturally this way, and he said in 1611, we've been messing up on the order of the books here for about 1,500 years. We put them in this order, we put them in that order. Martin Luther had his in a certain order, doesn't match. He says, let's get it, me, let's get it right, okay? Let's get it right. So all the new versions have to counterfeit this order of the books. But you can't put it this way unless you... It's just supernatural, okay? Let's look at the Old Testament books. I have Jewish history. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And then you have the life of Christ, Ruth, Moabitess, and Mary's Boaz, who's a Jew. That's us. The Shumanite woman. The Moabitess woman. That's us. Okay? First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Who's the kings and the priests in the new in the church age? Us. Ezra was a priest. Nehemiah was a builder, and then we come up to Esther. Esther's a Jew. She marries a Gentile king. All right. Now I'm going to just say that a transition here, right? Ahasuerus kicks out his Gentile bride and marries a Jewish woman. The next book of the Bible is Job, 42 chapters, 42 months, great tribulation, right? This is your order of your books. And then after Job, let the good times roll. <laughs> Psalm 1, 2, 3, 4. You got the Psalms, Proverbs, Gastes, Song of Solomon, and then... From Isaiah through Malachi, it takes you from the millennium all the way through to eternity. You couldn't have done it with a, uh, a doer machine if you tried, okay? All right, now let's look at the Bible. Let's talk about the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are primarily, and I put them in here, but they're primarily Old Testament books. They're transitional books because the New Testament don't say Right. Calvary at the, at the cross. So Jesus, a lot of his preaching is to Old Testament Jews. So you can really put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over here, and they take you to Calvary. And then what happens? Church age. 
13 epistles to 10 groups. 10, you guys know this. 10 is the name, is the uh, number for Gentiles. Gentiles. At least yeah. That's the traditional teaching. Let's just put it that way. 13 epistles. Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd. Any of those sound like Jewish names? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians? No, it's all over the Greek, all over the Greeks and the Romans. Usans, the Gentiles. Right. Hate when this happens. <laughs> Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. Goes back to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Got tribulation. That's right. right. I mean, you can't get more Jewish than Hebrews. Right? Amen. <laughs> and remember I said these were the books that were the latest, the last to be accepted, right? right? Because they were so different than these. Everybody loves these. This is where you have some trouble. Yeah. Because it, this is written to the Hebrews, and this is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Mm -hmm. Peter writes, uh, I think, a second apostle from Babylon. Kind of interesting. Because the Jews are all fouled up. In the tribulation, they make a treaty with the Antichrist. All right, that's a little extra bonus. Okay. Why did he write from Babylon? Because Babylon shows you how messed up the Jews are going to be in the tribulation. All right. yeah. Jew, that sounds like a real Christ, uh, uh, Gentile name, doesn't it? <laughs> And then you go to Revelation. Well, Revelation is a recap of the church history age. Then you go into the tribulation, right? Revelation. Revelation to the tribula I mean to the millennium. Right. And out into eternity. Amen. There's no way that those Puritans had any idea how to do that. Right. Remember, we started in 1500 BC with a blank piece of paper. Right. Actually, no piece of paper. We were waiting for the stone tablets to come in. <laughs> yeah. right. right. Let's talk about biblical numerics. I understand one brother here recently talked about biblical numerics, so I'm not going to beat this to death. But the KJ 1611 defines for the universe what numbers mean. One of the most interesting things about on the KJ 1611 is the use of biblical numbers, or also called biblical numerics. Now, let's see if I can find Brother Ed Velo's book. Should have had it out. Brother Ed Velo is similar to your Ed Demers. <laughs> he counts the Bible. He counts words. He counts, 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 and does all that. It's important. Ed, wave for us. Get yourself on camera. There's Ed, but you can't see on the wrong side of the camera. All right. But anyway, you can count your AV 1611. You can't do that with the new versions, okay? He counts he, verses. Uh, Well, if you want to, come and look at this book later on. But this is phenomenal. What's the author of that book? Oh, this is Ed Below. The name of the book is Biblical Mathematics, Key, the Keys to Scripture Numerics. Evangelist Ed F. Below. Biblical Numerics deals with the way numbers are used consistently throughout the Bible. Let me give you some examples here. My examples. And I cut some of these out. I cut some of my examples out because it goes on and on and on and on. It kind of drags a little bit. I, uh, but sometimes uh, it's not bad to go on and on and on so you can prove the point. But since you've already had some of this, I'll just, I'll just use the, the standard one, 13. Everybody knows 13. Yeah. I'll show you 13 that even Ed has not even known. <laughs> Ned doesn't know, I'm sure. Biblical numerics. How about the number 13? The reason why I do that is because the Bible uh, defines 13. First time 13 is used in the Bible is in Genesis 14. It's a kind of a law of first mention in your Bible. When a word or a number or a concept or whatever is used the first time in the Bible, it usually defines itself that way throughout the Bible, more or less consistently. Twelve years and they served Cheroloma, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. 
when does a turn a teenager turn a teenager? Thirteen. 13. When did when does your sweet little girl all of a sudden start turning into a vampire? <laughs> <laughs> And all the sucking, what did you say? I oh, God. I heard somebody say, ah, a blood sucking vampire. <laughs> no, no, they're still sweet, eh, man. Bless their little hearts. Actually, it's the boys that are really hard to uh, handle. Yeah, 13. Yeah. You know, you play a little league. At least I played a little league. It's amazing, but they have little league from, what is it, nine years old? Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. They don't have it at 13. They knew something. <laughs> you have little league up till 13. Amen. The dragon occurs 13 times in Revelation. Judas Iscariot is spelled with 13 letters. This is a postage stamp. This is a bull. This is a woman riding on the bull. Where have you seen before in your Bible where somebody is riding on a beast? Yeah. Revelation. Revelation. The European Parliament, ding, 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 as their symbol picks that. Are we close to the end times or what? Are, and then this, a corollary to that question is, are they stupid or are they stupid? Yeah. They're very stupid. But there's a spirit. <laughs> there's a spirit behind that. Look at this fish down here. That's Dagon, the, the fish, fish god. god yeah. Wow. Hey. Now, I'm a Miami Dolphin fan, okay? Oh, no. Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> I tell you what, to put that hat on with the, with the fish god on the top is just, I always say, well, I'm wearing my Dagon hat. Amen. There's the Dagon, there's the beast, and there's the woman riding on the beast. Wow. It comes out of Greek mythology, and it's totally perverted, that whole thing. And they picked it as their symbol. There's 13 words in the harlot superscription in Revelation 17, 5. Here it is. When I say superscription... Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now notice the money here. They put the woman on the bull. Same way down here. The woman and the bull. Nimrod. He's a type of the Antichrist. He's the 13th from Adam. In the Old Testament, you mess up. You get 40 stripes minus 1, which is 39, which is 3 times 13. Judas is numbered as one of the 12 in Mark 14, Luke 22, John 6, 26. 12 plus 1 equals 13. Have you ever seen this before? Mm -hmm. Amen. How many colonies were there when we rebelled? Thirteen. Yeah, you got it. Ding, ding. <laughs> How many stars and stripes are in the American flag when they rebelled? Thirteen. Isn't that a wild thing? How the history runs by the book? It just so happens, thirteen stars. Now, when I show this in the South. Yeah. Folks get really upset. Okay. But I'm up more, so amen. We're going to go for it, amen. Where do you see this flag? Confederate battle flag. Yes. Amen. Now, who can guess how many stars are in the Confederate battle flag? 13. Did you know that before, or did you just know that? No, I didn't. You, can, you know it now. A long time ago. And what's on a Confederate battle flag bigger than Dallas? What they say? An X. Is X a good thing to have on your flag? No. Who won the war between the North and the South? All right. Now we'll delete this from the tape. We when we. Somehow I have to do this on the internet. For those from the north, you can re you can watch this one, and then those in the south, you watch that. It's the you know, here's that X. 
When I show that down south, they just they just are gas. They can't believe how they were they were destined to lose. Yeah? <laughs> now, I'm in the United States Air Force. I have just learned about new numbers in the Bible, right? And uh, I'm sitting there and I'm going. I'm listening to a briefing or something, and I'm looking at the Air Force emblem, and I'm saying, "Very many stars are in the Air Force emblem." The Air Force. Anybody from the Army in here? The the Air Force rebelled against the Army, said we want our own service right after World War II. Well, you'll never guess how many stars are in the Air Force emblem. Thirteen. Now, don't forget Friday Thirteen. <laughs> Now, the number 13 goes into 999999, exactly 76923 times. The reason why this is important is because when I worked at Air Force Technical Application Center, we were getting boxes from the European Union, and they had 666 on them, but in order for you to think it wasn't 666, they would put a little dash underneath the, or on top of the 6, to make you think it was a 9. Mm -hmm. But it was six, six, six. Now, common fractions. Common fractions with 13 in the denominator have six digit repeating sequences in their expansions. You understand what that was? No. Nope. I didn't understand it when I read it the first time. You've got to think about it. Let me show you what that means. One divided by 13 is 0 0.076923. I mean, 0 0.076923, and then it repeats again, 0 0.076923, and it goes on, 6 repeating, 6 repeating, 6 repeating. Look at 6 divided by 13, 0.123456, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 12 by 13. Point nine two three zero seven six nine two three zero seven six 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 six. That's just quick and deep, right? You don't think God can create hundred billion universes? He doesn't know how to do mathematics. Right? You better think again. There's more to these numbers than you could ever imagine. God invented mathematics. You divide yourself by 13, you're going to get 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6. You want to stay away from the devil. The number 13 is the sixth smallest prime number. Prime number is a number that you cannot divide yourself into. You know, like two to, uh, 4 can be divided by 2. Mm -hmm. right? But these can't be divided by anything but themselves. 1 is not considered a prime number. Number 13 is the sixth prime number. It's a very unusual, like I said, the Bible defined 13 as a rebellion. The number 13, oh wait, well, that's, a, that's the concept. <coughs> In modern day Wicca, 13 is considered the maximum size of a coven. It's also the goals of a witch. And one more thing, who's ever watched a presentation by Steve Jobs on the internet or on TV? He always saves the big item for the last. And he always say, oh, but one more, one last thing. So that's what I'm doing right now with respect. If you look here, you have aluminum right. and glass. Didn't Jesus say you're not supposed to build your hand, house upon the sand? Mm -hmm. right. Well, what's a, what's a uh, chip in your computer? What's it made of? Glass, glass silicon. Now, the atomic number of aluminum just happens to be 13. Just happens to be 13. Well, guess what Macintosh, guess what, guess what Apple decided to do when they built their brand new IMAX? They made them out of glass with an anodized aluminum frame. And here's the original Apple logo. Now, see how the devil is slick? Notice it says, see how it says Apple Computer Incorporation? Well, eventually they got rid of Apple Computer Incorporated and went to this. They got rid of the verbiage here and just let the bite out of the apple. But originally they had a they let they implied that there was the apple there, 
but really, but after the light had been taken out of it. And most of the world believes that Adam and Eve ate an apple. They actually ate a grape, most likely, but uh, according to the scripture, comparing scripture, but the world believes that Adam and Eve ate an apple. But notice how they covered up the fact that that bite was taken out of it. Yeah. And he says, you'll be as gods, and surely you'll not die. Mm -hmm. Notice on their Mac operating system X, on Intel, on an Intel chip, they switched to an Intel chip. And notice that X, it's in a black box. The first operating system X came out was in a black box. Those of you who hadn't seen this uh, this before, but this is a CD or yeah CD with the operating system on it. There's a leopard. It's called operating system leopard, characteristic of the Antichrist. Here's the X. Here's the apple symbol, like the Roman Catholic priest holds up the sun or the wafer, which is sun god. Operating system X. And when I started putting this slide up, I said, Apple computer is going to take us into the tribulation. And people laughed at me because they were only 1% of the computer industry. That was before iPod, iPad, iPhone, and the iMacs. Just to beat up on Apple a little bit more, this is their entrance to their uh, city, entrance to their store. <coughs> Notice the cube, mm -hmm. notice the uh, apple right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Well, remember we saw this? Oh, <clears throat> a box, mm -hmm. and inside's a little meteorite that those the, these Muslims mm -hmm. worship. I wonder which spirit is behind this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, amen. Look at that, right in the middle. So those some examples. Proverbs 13 with respect to chapter and verse markings. Look at 13, 13. Whoso despises the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. It has to do with the word of God. The first time the word sin is used in the Bible is in Genesis 13, 13. Now you need to turn to Genesis 13, 13 for this because this is high interest item right now in your culture. The word sodomy comes from the sodomites. Find the word sin is using your Bible is Genesis 13, 13, the number of rebellion. And Genesis 13, 13 says, and you may want to put a little mark by it, so that when you run into this culture, you can be confident that God is against it completely. Right. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Yeah. And he burns them out. Fire and brimstone. Yeah. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. The only one who gets out is Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Lot's wife turns around, turns into a pillar of salt. God wipes out the whole men, women, children, dogs, dogs, <coughs> bum, bum, bum. You in a culture that is a sodomite culture, God's going to destroy it. He's going to burn it up. Amen. Seven sealed book. Your AB 1611, when it was first put together, had these things on the side. Anybody got these? Uh, let me see. Let's see what you got. Uh, yeah. Okay. We'll count this as seven. Whatever. But it had these raised seals. Do you have raised seals? Okay. He's got seven. So we'll go with this one. All right. They've changed it now since, you know, hundreds of years. But when the AB 1611 first, it had these, like, things on the side of it. Raised things on the side of it. Why did they do that? No real reason. It went on for hundreds of years, a couple hundred years of doing that. It's only until recently some of these modern publishers know what we're looking for, and so they start putting different numbers. But on this New American Standard Bible that I had back in 
1977, or, yeah, when I was 25 years old, it has only six of them. But the 8611 had seven. Where did they get that idea? What is the correlation? Well, because, and I saw on the right hand, Revelation 5, 1 to 5, and I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Who's able to open up the seven seal book? Jesus. Just Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So that's just something that's in our history on the AB 1611, but very peculiar. We already talked about this. Well, maybe we didn't. Purified seven times. He had William Tyndale's translation, Coverdale's, Matthew's, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, AB 1611. These are printed Bibles. The historical fact, the seventh was the AB 1611. But not only was it purified to get to the AB 1611, but it was purified seven times, as I said earlier. And it's additions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the first, purified seven times. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Mm -hmm. So back in 1000 BC, when David wrote that down, God in his foreknowledge says, for us in the, in the year 2011, if you want to look for a Bible, this is the characteristics. The words of the Lord are pure words. So you're looking for a book that's pure, that claims to be pure. Doesn't have, you know, not a better translation of be, but claims to be pure. As silver tried the furnace of earth. So you're looking for a book that's been burned. Mm -hmm. Or at least the people's been burned. Or both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Purified seven times. So God doubles down. He does it forward and backwards. So you can't miss it. Only a, what was the word? Dimwit, Brother Ed? Only a yeah. dimwit with a college education by Bob Jones. With Greek, a Greek education would miss it. See, what we're doing is as Bible believers, we don't put we don't put this book on trial. We are just we believe it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you remember the first night I was here, after those few comparisons, it only took about five minutes and we sh we were done. If you had the right heart. If you understood what I was, if you, if the Holy Spirit was speaking to you, I had an honest heart. I didn't have to go for Saturday, Sunday morning, and Sunday night, did I? Mm -hmm. It was a done deal. This was, and you just go on. You go on with the rest of your life. But we're at the end. We're in the remnant, and we have to continue to uh, contend for the faith. Now, the King's English, the King's English. This would be on your, um, which one would this be? This would be number seven on your notes, kind of follow along, okay? You may want to take a few notes on the side here as I talk to this. This is a busy slide. This, you would, this would never pass in any official, you know, briefing or in the Air Force or military. This is too busy. No one's going to read this slide. This, is, this causes your eyes to glaze over. You know, it's the evening, nobody, if you haven't had a cup of coffee, you're done. You're going to go to the I understand that. But sometimes I put a slide up for effect. All right? The King James Version Bible, this is the King's English. It can make claims uh, into its language that the new versions cannot. I've listed ten. These are ten, I believe, from Ripplinger's book. All right? I could spend a whole, I could do a whole course just on the King's English. I could go 18 hours, 20 hours. It's amazing, your Bible. It contains a built-in dictionary. I tell guys in prison, you want to learn how you get yourself a King James Version Bible and read it. I was in the airport delayed in uh, uh, Atlanta. I was sitting with a Chinese lady and she said, my English is not very good. You know what I told her? Actually, what she told me, she told me that my son said, if you want to learn English, you get yourself a King James Version Bible. 
because it's a built-in dictionary. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it defines its words in the text. Yep. You would be surprised if you come across a word within the text mostly, either in that verse or somewhere in the context, it will define the verse. Do you think God would give you a book that, that you would need a dictionary for? No. Do you think you would? It's a self-contained... You go in here, if you need to know what a word is, you learn what the, how the King James Version Bible uses the word, and that's the definition for it. Okay? You don't go to a dictionary, you don't go to lexicon, you don't go to the Greek. King James Version Bible has its own built-in dictionary. You cannot say that of the new versions. The new versions are a mess. They're not consistent in their use of the words. King James Version is. The vocabulary and reading level build from Genesis to Revelation. So it's like a crescendo. As, you, as the Bible keeps using words over and over again, you start getting more and more vocabulary and more and more vocabulary. So that's why I tell those guys in prison, read a King James Version, start in Genesis and push your way through. God wanted his book. My children learned how to read using the King James Version Bible. People in Africa, North America, India, they learn English and they learn how to read. Guys in prison, whatever. You can learn, you can teach yourself English using the King James Version Bible. Why God would make a Bible that you can read. He's not going to, like we saw the, the funny words that were used in the new versions. God has made you a Bible that you can read. He wants you to read it. He doesn't want to make it difficult. Many of the words, words in this Bible are one or two syllable words. It's easier to read. Right. The devil comes out and says, well, these new versions are easy to read. They're lying to you. Yeah. This is the one that's easy to read. You say, I don't understand the these and the thous. Who said that? Who has ever said that or heard that? Well, I don't understand the these and the thous, and I don't, don't, don't understand the ease. You know, how, uh, if you read it enough, you would understand. Any thee or thou, a T word is singular. That means just one person. A plural word is a Y. Ye. Nicodemus, I used this example before. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Nicodemus, Jesus said, ye must be born again. So I know thee is he's talking to Nicodemus. And he's talking about the whole Jewish nation. Ye must be born again. If I picked up an NIV, you know what it'd say? Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Well, is he talking about Nicodemus? About all the Jews. But he said, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Everybody has to be born again, not just Nicodemus. Right. Marvel not that I say to you, right. you must be born again. He's not just talking to Nicodemus. He's talking to everyone right. you don't know in the New International Version. But God wants you to know. That's why he puts the E's in there, because it's a window on the language behind it. Okay? So V and E, that's the most complex thing I can think of. Everything else is simple. So if you know V, like V and Thou... That's singular. And the why, ye or you, would be plural. I would say 99% of the time, you'll be all right. Words have appropriate sound and symbolism. The S words, s, be like snake, and sin, and sinner, and serpent. Your language, your letters mean certain things have certain connotations like damn, damage, dumb, dump. See how those, those words, you go, you, a letter has a certain connotation in your Bible and that's used consistently throughout. It's the only book giving access to the pure language lexicons of the 16th and 17th, 17th centuries. What does that mean? It means, oh, what the definition of a Greek word is based on this. Because the AV 16, 1611 translators were using pure lexicons. If they, were, if they were wanted to know the definition of a word, they were closer to the Greek, they were closer to the Hebrew, and when they did want to know what a word meant in a lexicon, like a 
you know, what does the Greek word mean in English? They were close, they had pure lexicons. So if I wanted to, if I really wanted to know what a Greek word meant, I showed you earlier, I take the English and the King James Version Bible and I get the direct, I get the exact cross-reference to Greek or Hebrew. That's not true today. The lexicons that are today were made by are not necessarily pure. They're tainted. They're twisted because certain people want the Greek words to say certain things. Mm -hmm. Strong's Concordance, for example, you better be careful about that if you go into the back. A Strong's Concordance. He doesn't tell you all the definitions for the words. He has an agenda. He has an agenda. He has certain doctrines that he wants to pro uh, proliferate. So you can't go. When a guy, usually on the radio, he says, the Greek, in the Greek it says this, he's usually going to a lexicon, mm -hmm. which most likely is corrupt. Mm -hmm. He could just stick with the King James Version and he'd have the exact words of God. Sister, hold your question for after on that. It provides a transparent view of the Greek and Hebrew, just like I said. It uses internationally recognized vocabulary and spelling. We don't have time for that. But the endings, like the EST endings, knowest thou this? You could find those same endings in the German and the Italian and the French, because they use endings on their words. So if I wanted to make translations, which many people did, I could take a King James Version Bible and I almost know all the endings for the, the verbs already because they're in here. A linguist would understand what I'm understand more what I'm talking about. But those EST endings are not put in there uh, just to make the word make it harder. They're in to show that that's the the root and that's the ending that you would find in uh, Italian, German, whatever, the other uh, uh, European languages. It uses literary devices enhancing memorization. We've lost our ability to memorize the scripture because we've gone through these new versions. And I'll give you an example in the next slide. The sentence structure enhances ac accurate doctrinal interpretation. <coughs> what does that mean? In the, in the end times, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They will not have sound doctrine. And the reason why they don't have sound doctrine is over and over again in my comparisons, they're messing up the words. So you don't have where it says were washed. Our King James Version says are washed. They're messing up the doctrines because they're messing up the words. Words and sentences are consistent. That's, how you, that's why you can look up the word like gainsayer and find out what that means in the King James Version Bible. So what's a gainsayer? Well, have some fun. See if you can find out what it is from the King James Version Bible. Because I had to. I had to do that once in prison. Provides the precision and longevity of a legal document. This thing has been around for 400 years. This is it. This is the document. It ain't going to change. You know, once a document, will and testament has been signed, that's it, right? You have to make another will and testament which has to be signed. All right, that's it. It's right there. Now, let me show you a little bit about this language. It's not only literary, it's also poetic and also has things like alliteration and rhythm and everything. I'm going to, I can sing this, I can sing this in the Bible. Try that with an NIV or something else. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. All right, that was verse 7, look, verse 8. Has the same syllabication and same rhythm. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, and the much fun gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Now, how do you explain that? Verse 9. Do you think it's going to have the same melody? Mm -hmm. How do you explain it? That's, that's not translation. That's going over the top of translation. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. <laughs> the judgments of the Lord are true. And righteous all together, more to be desired are they than gold and much fine gold. It's got rhythm. 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 And that's not only just in the Psalms, but that's other places in the Bible. Uh, 
Now one to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, be only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Talked about this. It's the Bible to use the right text. The new versions are a product of the bad line of texts. The Alexandrian family. And the final thing is that the AB 1611 is a blood-washed book. Yeah. If I had any fingerprint that I wanted to emphasize in this whole thing, it's this one right here. This is what makes it. In the Bible, whatever was used in the ministry of God was purged with blood. Amen. Look at the Old Testament. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Yeah. The AB 1611 is a blood wash book. We talked about St. Bartholomew's massacre, where the Protestants were massacred by the Roman Catholic Church. We talked about the Inquisition of the Romans. These are all your forefathers. Roman Catholic Inquisition. In Revelation it says, yeah. all, and then all the men that work with William Tyndale to print his, new, his English New Testament were martyred, except for Coverdale. Revelation 6 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw on this altar the souls of them that were slain for the what? The word of God. God. And for the testimony which they held. <clears throat> Got the right order of books, <clears throat> number of books, biblical numerics, interesting chapter and verse markings. Seven sealed book, purified seven times. He used the King's English. Last to use the right text in a blood washed book. AB 1611. It's our <coughs> book. It's our book. It's our one and only book. It's the king of all the books. Let's Amen. pray. Amen. Dearly Father, thank you for. Allowing us to do the scripture seminar, we thank you for us and showing us these things. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, uh, that will do it for that. Just